Welcome back, everyone. Ready for another deep dive? Today, um, today it's Einstein's theory of relativity, but, and this is interesting, with a twist. Oh. The, uh, the sources you sent, you know, they explore relativity, but also how it like connects to, well, how we perceive the world. Ah, I see. Yes, that is fascinating. It is. Really. And it's a connection uh, that the materials really dig into right from the start. They challenge, you know, those common sense ideas about space and time, mm -hmm. the ones we all kind of grow up with. Yeah, for sure. Like yeah. time, for example. We just think of it as this this constant thing. Like it, it's the same for everyone everywhere. But I guess if we really picture it, you know, it's not actually that simple. It gets complicated when you start to think about the universe, you know, mm -hmm. the, the scale of it all. Yeah. Imagine, just imagine trying to actually have a conversation with someone on Mars hmm. in real time. Oh, wow. Yeah. The delay, right, yeah. because of the speed of light. Well, there now would always be in our past. Mm. So that common sense idea that simultaneity is the same for everyone, well, it starts to fall apart. So you're saying there isn't one single now for everyone. Whoa, that's kind of big deal, right? It is. And Einstein, well, his theories, they showed us that space and time, they're not separate. They're actually interwoven. Yeah. Together, they form this four-dimensional this four dimensional fabric. We call it space-time. Space-time. Okay, I'm trying to wrap my head around that one. But I guess it does make sense. Our, like, simple ideas about space and time, I mean, they probably wouldn't hold up when you're talking about, like, the entire universe. But how did scientists even begin to question these ideas in the first place? Well, let's go back in time for a second, back to the 19th century. Okay. Back then, scientists believed in this substance, this mysterious substance called ether. Right, right. And they thought it filled, like, the entire universe. Mm. And the ether was what they thought light waves traveled through. Oh, I remember learning about that. So it was kind of like how sound waves need air to travel, right? They need a medium. Exactly. But then, well, they designed this experiment mm. to prove the ether existed. It was supposed <laughs> to be, like, the definitive proof. The Michelson-Morley experiment. That's the one. But get this, they didn't find any evidence of ether at all. Really? So what happened then? Did everyone just like shrug and <laughs> move on? Well, not quite. One physicist, a guy named Lorentz, he really tried to make that ether theory work. Okay. He, sure. he proposed this idea. It was that objects, they actually shrink mm -hmm. in the direction that they're moving. Hold on. They shrink, like physically get smaller. That was his idea, yeah. yeah. And the crazy thing is, it actually explained the results of the Michelson-Morley experiment. But then it also, it introduced a bunch of new problems. Like trying to force a square peg into a round hole? Ha <laughs> ha, yeah. Mm. It was a clever workaround, for sure, but it didn't really solve the, the underlying issue. Which is where Einstein comes in, right? Exactly. I'm guessing he wasn't a fan of shrinking objects either. He had a totally different approach. Oh, I bet. He basically said, you know, let's just get rid of the ether altogether, poof. And then he proposed the principle of relativity, which is basically, the laws of physics should be the same for all observers. Yeah. You know, as long as they're moving at a constant velocity. So it doesn't matter how fast you're moving, the laws of physics work the same way. I mean, what are the implications of that? Like, what does that actually mean? Well, it leads to some pretty, uh, some pretty mind-bending concepts. Things like time dilation, length contraction. Right. And, of course, his famous equation, EMC war. Yeah, EMC war, of course. Now, time dilation, I think I remember reading something in those materials about how the lifespan of certain particles, it actually changes at high speeds. Is that right? That's right. The materials mention uh, fast-moving particles called mesons. And they actually live longer when they're moving close to the speed of light. Direct evidence of time dilation. Whoa, so their clocks are literally slowing down. That's crazy. Okay, now what about this emc watt equation? That's the one that says mass and energy are basically the same thing, right? Exactly. It's this revolutionary concept. Mass can be converted into energy and vice versa. Right. And this principle, it's at work all the time in things like nuclear reactors, even even the sun. It's constantly converting mass into energy. So hold on, the sun is basically like a giant mass to energy conversion machine. It's hard to imagine how much energy is actually being produced there. It's mind boggling. And you know, Einstein even said that light itself, even light, it has what we call effective mass. Hmm. He had this thought experiment with a box a box full of light. Wait, a box full of light? I got to hear this. Okay, so he pictured this box, right? Yeah. 
with these perfectly reflecting walls. And inside, there's just light bouncing around. And he showed that because light exerts pressure, it actually behaves as if it has mass. Yeah. Even though it's pure energy. That's that's fascinating. Okay, so we have this idea that space and time, they're all tangled up together. And yeah. then mass and energy are like two sides of the same coin. And then our perception of time, well, it's not as fixed as we thought. So is there a way to like visualize all of this in a way that makes sense? Actually, yeah. The, uh, the materials you sent, they discuss this thing called the K-calculus. It uses radar signals to help us, you know, grasp the relationship between space and time. Radar signals, huh? So we're talking about using echoes to, like, map out space time. Exactly. Okay, now this is where it gets really interesting. Tell me more about this. It's a really cool approach, actually. The whole thing hinges on the fact that information like those radar signals, well, it can only travel the speed of light, right? Oh, right. So it just naturally builds in those delays, you know, those delays we experience in how we perceive events. Because the speed of light is finite. It's not instantaneous. Okay, okay. I think I'm with you so far. But how does, using radar, how does that help us see something like time dilation? Like, practically. Okay, so picture this. Two observers. One is stationary, just hanging out. The other one is moving, but moving super fast. And they both send out these radar pulses to measure how far away an object is. So they're both using those echoes to figure out the distance? Yeah, exactly. But here's the thing. The moving observer, they're actually closer to the object when that radar pulse bounces back to them. Oh. So they're going to measure a shorter round trip time compared to the stationary observer. So it's like time is moving slower for the moving observer because yeah. their measurements are different. Exactly. That difference in how they're measuring time, that's time dilation. And the K-calculus, it just makes it so much easier to grasp mm. because it's tangible, you know. Yeah, it's not just some abstract idea anymore. It's like something we can actually measure. Now, the materials also mention something called proper time. What exactly is that? Proper time, it's really important in relativity. It's basically the time measured by a clock that's at rest relative to whatever events are being measured. Got it. So in our radar example, the moving observer's clock, that's measuring their proper time for the journey, right? And it's going to be different from the stationary observer. <laughs> Exactly. And this this leads us to a really famous thought experiment. It perfectly illustrates how strange time dilation can be. It's the you've probably heard of it, the twin paradox. Ah, yes, the twin paradox. One twin stays on Earth, the other blasts off in a spaceship at close to the speed of light. And then And then when the traveling twin comes back to Earth, they've aged less than the twin who stayed behind. It's like the traveling twin took a shortcut through time or something. In a way, yeah. <laughs> Their proper time elapsed slower because they were moving so close to the speed of light. It's mind-blowing, really. But is that just a like a theoretical paradox? It can't actually happen in real life, can it? Actually, it has been verified. Right. With real experiments. They flew atomic clocks around the world. And the clocks that traveled at higher speeds, well, they showed a tiny but measurable difference in elapsed time. Wow. So time travel isn't totally science fiction after all. Well, not in the way we usually think of it. Yeah. You know, hopping in a time machine and going back to see the dinosaurs. Yeah. But it does show us the time. It's not this absolute thing. The twin paradox, it really blows apart this idea we have that there's this universal clock ticking away at the same rate for everyone. Right, right. Okay, I'm starting to get it. Relativity, it's not just equations on a chalkboard, is it? It actually changes how we understand reality itself. And speaking of understanding reality, our source materials, they went even further, right? They suggested a connection between relativity and how we perceive the world around us. Yeah, and it is a fascinating connection. Just like there's no absolute frame of reference in physics, our perception of reality, it's also a construction. Our brains, they take all this sensory data all the time, and then they interpret it based on our past experiences, our expectations, even our emotions at that moment. Whoa, okay. So we're not just passively observing the world. We're actually creating our own versions of reality. It's a pretty wild idea when you really think about it. Our brains are like always building these internal models of the world based on the information they get. So we each have our own unique model of reality based on all our different experiences. Exactly. And that's why sometimes, you know, two people can witness the same event and come away with completely different ideas about what happened. That makes me think about those optical illusions mm. where you can see like two different images in the same picture. It just depends on how you look at it. Yeah, <laughs> it's a perfect analogy. Our perception, it's not always a perfect reflection of what's actually out there. So if we all have these different perceptions, these subjective views, how do we ever agree on anything? How do we learn to like see things more objectively? 
Well, the materials you provided, they talk about the work of Jean Piaget, a psychologist who studied how kids, how they learn about the world. Mm. And he found that, well, kids don't actually start out with this understanding of object permanence, that idea that objects still exist even when we can't see them. Oh, right, right. Like babies, when you play peekaboo with them, it's like they genuinely think you've disappeared. Exactly. But as they grow, they interact with the world more. They touch things, they move things, they explore. And gradually, they learn to perceive this more stable, this more objective reality. They discover these invariants, these things that stay constant, even when their perspective changes. So our perception of reality is based on these invariants, these like fundamental truths about how the world works. Yeah, basically. And these invariants, they can be really subtle. Even something like just our perception of a straight line, it's actually a construction. Hold on. How can a straight line be a construction? It just like is, or at least I thought so. It's pretty wild, right? Our eyes, they're always making these tiny little movements. They're called saccades. Yeah. And our brains, they use the information from these movements to like stitch together this sense of straightness. So our brains are making a straight line from a bunch of jerky eye movements. I never knew that. Uh it's amazing, right? It really shows how active our brains are in shaping how we perceive the world. It's not just passively taking in information. It's constantly working on it. It's like our brains are these master editors, right? They take all the raw footage from our senses and then they edit and filter it to create a picture of reality that makes sense to us. Exactly. And that editing process, well, it can be influenced by so many things. Our past experiences, what we expect to see, our beliefs, you know, even our mood. It's all in there. That reminds me, I think there was an example in the materials about how if you tell someone what letter they're looking at in a blurry image, it suddenly becomes clear. Yeah, that's a classic one. It shows that our prior knowledge yeah. and what we expect, they can totally change what we see. It's like, we're not just seeing the world as it is, we're seeing it as we expect it to be. That's pretty profound, isn't it? It is, and it gets even deeper. When we start to think about how we experience things like depth, you know, three-dimensional space. Okay, now you've got my attention. How does our perception of space tie into all this? Well, think about how we perceive depth, that three-dimensional aspect of the world. It's not just about having two eyes. It's also about how the images we see change as we move. So it's like our brains are constantly like triangulating our position based on all the shifting perspectives from our eyes. Right. As we walk around, objects that are closer to us, they seem to change faster than things that are further away. And our brains, they use that information along with things like shadows and other visual cues to build up this sense of depth and distance. It's amazing how much our brains are doing without us even realizing it. Like, we take our perception of reality for granted, but it's this incredibly complex, constantly updating construction. And this idea that reality is constructed, it challenges something we usually take for granted. The idea of permanent objects, it's kind of central to how we think, right? I mean. What if, instead of seeing the world as made up of these static things, we saw it as, like, this dynamic interplay of processes and relationships? So instead of thinking in nouns, we're thinking in verbs. The universe is this constant dance of change and flux. Exactly. And that view, it actually lines up really well with Einstein's relativity, where space and time are fluid and connected and even mass and energy. They're ultimately just different aspects of the same underlying reality. It's like that saying, right? The one about stepping in the same river twice. Yeah, you can't. The river's always changing, and so are we. Exactly. And honestly, that might be like the most profound thing about all of this about exploring relativity and perception together. They're both challenges, don't they? They make us question these assumptions we have about reality, that it's fixed, that it's unchanging. But the universe is so much more dynamic than that yeah. and interconnected. Wow. This has been, I mean, really such an incredible deep dive. We started by looking at these everyday ideas we have mm. about space and time, and then we jumped headfirst into time dilation and the twin paradox. And now we're actually questioning the very nature of reality itself. It's a lot to take in. It is. And throughout it all, we've seen these amazing connections, haven't we? Between like the immensity of the universe and how our own minds work. It's all linked. It really makes you think if our perception, what we see and experience, if it's so subjective and reality is this constant state of flux and change, I mean, what does that even mean for us, for how we understand our place in the cosmos? That's a big question, for sure. One worth really thinking about. And the materials, they end on a pretty thought-provoking note, I think. Oh, yeah? They ask us to consider 
what if permanent objects, what if that whole idea is just an illusion and the universe is actually, at its core, this dynamic dance of relationships and change? It's almost a little humbling, isn't it, to think that what we experience every day, it's just this tiny little piece of something much, much bigger and more complex. <laughs> it is, but it's also really exciting. Huh? Oh, absolutely. The more we learn about the universe, the more we realize we don't know. There's so much out there left to discover. I feel like this deep dive has, I don't know, it's given me a whole new perspective. Like I'm seeing things through new eyes. That's the power of learning, right? It opens up these new ways of thinking. It challenges us to see the world in a different light. And for anyone listening, if you're feeling even a little bit of that same spark, you know that curiosity, keep exploring, learn more about relativity, delve into the world of perception, and never stop questioning the nature of reality itself. Who knows? Maybe you'll be the one to make the next big discovery. Absolutely. So until next time, keep those minds curious and keep those perspectives open.